From coast to coast, live via satellite, it's time to praise the Lord. Major Christian events in America and across the world, covering over 500 million souls with the good news of new life in Jesus Christ. Now, from Southern California, we invite you to be a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Praise the Lord, Dr. Lloyd Ogilvy, Dr. Robert Schuller, and ministering in music, the Hawaiian, and Johnny Alex Brown. And ready to take your call. Some of the most beautiful prayer partners in the world. Now your hosts, president and founders of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Paul and Jay. Welcome, 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 everybody. It is time to praise the Lord. Pull up your big rocking chair in front of the television set. Get the family, the kids, the dogs around the set. We're going to have a great time tonight. We're going to have music. We're going to sing praises unto the Lord. We have two of our favorite guests in the whole world here with us tonight, Dr. Robert Schuler, Dr. John Lloyd Ogilvy, and, uh, of course, the Hawaiians, my goodness, and Shawnee Brown, oh my goodness. Well, it's going to be a very special night. So we are just here to praise the Lord with you, tell you we love you, and wish all of our mommies a very happy, happy Mother's Day. It is Mother's Day this Sunday, isn't it? And so many times today, as I was just thinking about Sunday, and I've already bought my mother's Mother's Day gift when we were down in Miami, but I was just thinking, I've got to do something special for her. And I was just thinking about her today and just exactly what I could do. And as you think of your mother, you think of, you know, so, I mean, all the years of that precious lady in my life and what an example and what a beautiful person she was. What a privilege I had to be able to grow up uh, with her and to just love her. She was my friend and is my friend. And. She's my mother and just a very special person in my life. And I was just thinking of some of the fun things that we did and some of the beautiful things and joys that we had together. Um, I just wish I could be there with you, Mom, but I love you. And I love all the mothers that are watching. And we're just, we're just so glad to be able to. I'm so glad somebody started honoring mothers on Mother's Day. That's just very special. And we love all of you mothers, and you're beautiful. I need one or two of those little mothers or grandmothers to, to adopt me this year. My little mommy is in heaven, and um, she went to be with Jesus back in 1976. But um, one little story that I might just tell about my little precious mother. I remembered this when she told me about it, but I didn't understand it till I was a man. But when I was in Bible school, she told me about a very tragic, well, I guess by the world standard, it would be a very tragic experience. We were returning from the land of Egypt, where we were missionaries. We were coming home on furlough, and on the boat, leaving uh, Cairo, leaving Alexandria, actually, uh, as a small child, I came down with a very, very serious case of what was known as bacillary dysentery. It's the, it's the killer kind, the kind that very few people recover from. And they actually had to stop the whole ship and let me off in Genoa, Italy. For 30 days, I hovered between life and death in a hospital there. This was during the Second World War. Hitler was invading Italy from the north. And uh, we finally had to evacuate the hospital and get out as the invading Nazi army came on down into Italy. 
I remember how painful, how high the fever was. Um, but I remember one night, very, very specially. I remember my mother rarely left my bed, but this night the doctor had told her, and she told me this story later, that I had reached the crisis point. It's a point where the fever soars unusually high, 106, 107, even 108 degrees. And if the fever breaks, it is called the crisis point. If the fever breaks and begins to come back down, rarely the patient will live. But most often, the, the temperature soars on beyond that that the human body can stand. So I can remember her praying for me that night in a very special and an unusual way. I remember, strangely enough, she literally placed her body across the bed and wept and cried and prayed with great fervor as I had never seen or experienced her praying before. That was the night the fever broke. That was the night I began to recover. That was the night that God heard and answered prayer. That was the night, and I began to mend rapidly at that point, and just in time, because as I said, in the next day or two, we had to evacuate the hospital. They sent a little German nurse home with us by the name of Heidi Hanover. That's pretty German sounding, isn't it? But let me tell you one little par parenthetical miracle right here. Mothers, don't ever quit praying for your kids. Oh, hang in there. God's going to save them. God is going to heal them. God is going to take care of them. If you'll do your part. Now, my little mama did her part there in that Genoa, Italy hospital. Now, what, 45 years ago or so. Okay. We brought little Hedy home with us. While she was at home, she attended church, got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, went back to Germany after I recovered sufficiently. In fact, they made her leave the country because war then was really breaking up between the United States and Germany. We didn't hear from Hedy all during the war, but when the war was over, we got a letter, and she said, Oh, you'll never know what a blessing it was for me to have found Jesus as my Savior there in America. All during the war here in Germany, I've been going from prayer meeting to prayer meeting, from church to church, from house to house, and we have seen God do miracles. We have just had wonderful times of fellowship in the Lord. We couldn't have made it through this war without the power of God. So the Lord took evil and turned it into good in this case in several different ways. Well, anyhow, back to that night when I was a man and I was in Bible college. My mother sat me down and she said, Son, I don't know if you remember that special night in Genoa, Italy, when I prayed so hard, when I literally put myself across your bed and cried out to God. She said, Son, I've waited this long to tell you because you wouldn't have understood it as a child. But into your room that night, I saw with my eyes the angel of death that had come to claim you. She said, I literally put my body in between that dark shadowy figure, figure that I could see even with my natural eyes. And I began to cry out to God. She said, I literally threw my body across your body on that hospital bed. And I would not fail. That angel of death touched you. And in the name of Jesus, we conquer. And she said, that was the night your fever broke. That was the night the doctor came to me with a smile on his face and said, your son will recover. She said, I just tell you that little story now that you're a man to let you know that we serve a wonderful God who can save, who can heal, who can keep. And, uh, oh, I'll never forget that little story that my precious mother. So, Mama, in heaven where... Whatever street up there you're dancing on today, just know that we love you and I love you and we'll be with you soon because somehow in my spirit I feel that it won't be too much longer till we'll be seeing your little papa and we'll be seeing my precious mother and my father and so many of our loved ones. Someone wrote an old song one day that said, Heaven's getting dearer all the time. I love the one that says, Tell Mother. I'll, I'll be, be there, there yes. in answer to her prayers. How many mothers have <clears throat> never turned loose of that child? 
don't turn loose of yours, Mother. They're going to make it, yes. and you're going to pray them in. I'm going to agree with you in Jesus' name. Happy, happy, happy Mother's Day to you. We love you. Your children love you, too. Sometimes they have funny ways of showing it. But they do, I promise you. They love you, and they will, and keep praying for them. And we'll all make it to heaven together. We really will. Let's do one other little thing. All of the mothers in our audience here, would you just stand? And I'm going to have Jan, who is the mother of my two sons, to say a little prayer and lead us in our opening prayer tonight. My, we have many mothers here tonight. Camera one, two, or three. Just the mothers. You men sit down. I'm asking just the mothers to stand. Um, <laughs> Can, can they hear me over there? Maybe we better turn the sound up a little bit. We want to honor all of our mothers here tonight. We love you. We really do. And if somebody wants to adopt an old 50-year-old German up there, <laughs> why, I'm available, all right? <laughs> all right. Father, how we love you and how we praise you and how we honor you. Yes. And Father, we thank you that you chose a beautiful little virgin girl to be the mother of your son, Jesus. And you said of that beautiful lady that she would be honored throughout time, the Virgin Mary. And Jesus' mother is honored. And Father, we thank you that every mother from the little hundred one years that writes us and says, yes. I'm still a TV and partner and I'm a mother, to the newest little mother that's just given birth and realizes that that life is her responsibility and her joy. Lord, bless them. Give them wisdom that only you can give. Give them peace when there's only storms around them. Give them joy when there's sadness. Give them the power to lay hands on those little ones and realize that all power in heaven and in earth has been given to them. And we praise you for that. Bless them. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 God bless you. The Hawaiians are here with us tonight. How we love them. Boy, didn't we have a great time down in Miami, our Pompano Beach, I guess, where we were. They were so, so anointed down there. And now they're back here tonight to bless us again. Let's tell Mark and Diane Yasuhara, welcome to praise the Lord tonight as they sing Walking in the Sunlight of His Love.
I have known him, for he deigns to walk with me. And the glory of his presence will be mine eternally, because that's what it's all about. It's the presence of the Lord coming to me in the reality of his life and the life and power of his Son. I'm so glad that we can be together tonight and share this kind of, this kind of life. Uh, we enjoy singing. We enjoy being with people. But most of all, we enjoy sharing not just the warmth and goodness and um, comforts and joys of this life, but especially of the life that we're enjoying and going to be enjoying forever. I wonder, you mind if we sing a little chorus? Lord gave me a little chorus last week when we were down in Florida with uh, Paul and Jan, and we shared it with the people there. Maybe you. Maybe you were able to see it then. Um, Warren, give us uh, a B flat or whatever key it's in. And, uh, and the song says, I will lift up my, uh, my heart. I will lift up my heart and give him glory. I will lift up the Lord and worship the King.
Beautiful, the Hawaiians. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll have lots more good music from them tonight, so get ready for it. We want you to meet Dan Greet and make very welcome our first wonderful, exciting guest tonight. Dr. Robert Schuler is founder and senior minister of the famed Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California. His telecast, Hour of Power, is one of the most widely viewed programs in television history. Author of 19 books, his two latest entitled Tough Times Never Last But Tough People Do and Tough Minded Faith for Tender Hearted People. Both books right now are listed in the top 10 bestsellers for the New York Times and the Time Magazine. Let's give him a Southern California welcome, a hometown welcome here tonight, Dr. Robert Schuler. Welcome, welcome. Are you one of these tough-minded people that you were talking about in the book? I, I, hope, I hope so. <laughs> you, you intend to be. I try to. Yeah. How are you? Good to see you. I'm marvelous. I plan it that way, pray it that way, expect it to happen, and it's happening. Amen. You had a wonderful Easter, I'm sure. Uh, marvelous. Great things. Wonderful. We, uh, we staged the uh, suffering and passion, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus in the Crystal Cathedral, and over 100,000 people saw it, and that was a great thing, just to tell the story so beautifully. Hi, Jan. Hi, Dr. How are you? Do you know what I was so blessed this week? I picked up a magazine and saw in it the story of your daughter that had lost her leg and how she is a championship skier now. <laughs> she has not let that little tiny thing that happened to her keep her from her goals, and that is fantastic. And you were in there? And that was great. She talked about the Lord and her faith in her life. Uh, that's in uh, the current issue of Us magazine, but she's not happy with the article oh, because she said they cut out all the good things she said about Jesus. Did say a little bit about it. So what to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the Lord is new every day. Yes, all right. <laughs> well said, well said. Well, we want to talk about uh, some of the good material I know that are in these books and hopefully help people get a little tougher tonight and maybe have some more faith and find out how to do that. But just before we do, uh, I know you're going to be blessed tonight with a, a wonderful brother that I understand you had the pleasure of meeting last night, Shoni Alex Brown. Oh, he is absolutely fantastic. I have just adopted him as my favorite violinist <laughs> in Southern California, <laughs> if not the world. And, you know, he, he's a miracle. He was shot through the chest when he was in uh, Auschwitz, I think. And... Uh, in fact, he let me feel the hollow in the chest where the bullet entered. And if he wasn't a violinist, he wouldn't be alive tonight. You know that story? Yes, 
we're going to let him tell it on, on television some night. It's a fascinating story. He is a survivor of the Holocaust, as is his wife, who is here with us tonight. And um, time permitting, I might just take this mic and run over and uh, chat with him a little bit uh, later on. Do you know what's unusual about him? He is not only a classical violinist, but he has a style that I don't know of any other classical performing artist on the violin that has. Because he learned violin music first from the gypsies, mm -hmm. uh, who knew how to fiddle, <laughs> he has become the classiest fiddler <laughs> I ever heard, right. and he weaves that into the classical style, and it creates a, well, it's the combination of two supposed contradictions, and out of it comes something that's very unique, very distinctive, and it is fantastic, and I'm going to have him an hour of power. Amen. You bet. It's a good idea. He's actually a native of Transylvania, which has become or now a part of Hungary, Romania. And uh, as Dr. Schuler said, learned his uh, uh, first violin techniques from the gypsies, hearing them play, and started picking up the violin at the tender age of five. He has studied at conservatories in Budapest, Hungary, Munich, and graduated with honors from the world-famous uh, Mozeum in Salzburg. Austria. I murdered that, I know. <laughs> After coming to the U.S., he studied with the sensitive and sophisticated Joseph Gengold at Western Reserve Unity in Cleveland, Ohio, and holds a Master of Arts in Music. He's now residing right here in Los Angeles, California. Give him a great praise welcome tonight, Shoni Alex Brown. That sounds uh, a little bit like an encore to me tonight, and we'll certainly have him uh, give you one. In fact, uh, he uh, takes that traditional old classic that was originally written as Danny Boy and was later rewritten by Dottie Rambo as he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs, and uh, we'll be hearing that in a little bit and some other wonderful renditions of beautiful... He, uh, Dr. Schuler, he does a... Pa if he ever comes to Crystal Cathedral, he does a package <laughs> of Jewish folk songs and dances that are just Incredible. absolutely the greatest. You know, uh, I have many of his cassettes, and I'd say that if anybody, anybody, anybody really wants great cassette music, you know, go to your music store and ask for them, because they probably don't have them, but they can order them. Yes. And uh, they're really terrific. Dr. Schuler, to, to have two major full-length books on the top ten all at once, that's got to be some kind of a record, doesn't it? Uh, 
they say it hasn't <laughs> happened before to a religious author. So that, but be that as it may, it's nice. Yeah. They're both dealing with somewhat the same subject, are they not? Although from a different perspective, mm -hmm. tough-minded faith for tender-hearted people. Tough times never last, but tough people. I guess tough is kind of the tying word between these two books. Uh, what's that telling you? I mean, the fact I think that it's telling us that the human beings in American society today that uh, are secular, do not have a relationship uh, with the Lord, are s seeking desperately for a strength to face and to cope with the f real and the fanciful uh, problems that face them. Mm -hmm. We're, I think, dealing with a high level of anxiety today in American society. People are afraid, and, uh, and uh, I think mm -hmm. that's it. Okay, what do you... What are you telling? What are you telling people makes them tough? Well, uh, that book opens and closes with the same lines. It opens with a prayer. It ends with a prayer. And so, in my opinion, st real strength and toughness comes when I know what I have to do as a divine calling. Mm -hmm. When I know where I, if I am where God wants me to be at this point in time in my life, I am tough. <laughs> All right. <laughs> really? If, I believe that. Yeah. And so, but the question is, uh, should I hold on or should I let go? So I open the book with a prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, in fact, may I look at it? I really <laughs> have it. He just well, wrote I, it, but he can't <laughs> remember that. Well, I, I don't. He's written another one, uh, yes. I'm working on another book since, so I'm into that. Lord, give me the guidance to know when to hold on. Because a lot of people let go too quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when to let go. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know when to let go. Lord, give me the guidance to know when to let hold on and when to let go. And the grace to make the right decision with dignity. Okay, mm. mm. that's a beautiful prayer. And obviously you have prayed it and found that place where... So have you? Yes. Yes, I believe, I believe Jan and I have, and we you thank know God you have. praise God for it. <laughs> you know you have, Paul. The, <laughs> the question is, how do you get there? Well, you should ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people come there from different routes, don't they? and uh, from different places. And the people that I hope are the people that read my books are the people that are still quite far away. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, I was thinking this last night, if we, if we take one, two, three, four points, let's suppose we have a circle. Here's a circle, and we draw other circles until we get to the center. Mm -hmm. Getting to where you have a relationship with the Lord and a real living relationship with Him. Let's say, call that the center. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the center. Some people are there. Some people are here. Some people are here. Some people are here. And some people e don't even know there are circles. <laughs> that okay? there is a circle, yes. Right. So I think that uh, there are some ministries that are here and they're talking to the people that are here. Mm -hmm. There are other ministries that are talking to these people and mm -hmm. here. Other mm -hmm. ministries to these people Beautiful. and these and here. Others to these and here. I think in my ministry I'm trying to talk to the people that are just maybe touching the rim. They may have fallen off and others that don't even know there's a rim. Mm. Am I communicating? I think so. Yeah. Let's, let's establish this. Our inside the circle basically is inside Christ. Is that what we're saying? Yes, yes. And I would okay. say inside Christ a Christian is, if any man is in Christ, okay, but, but within those that are authentic Christians, which would mean someone who has experienced the act of regeneration through the Holy Spirit. Yes. Within that circle, there are, of course, different levels of spirituality, yeah. right? It's called sanctification, isn't it? Yes, Where you I move think on that toward the I, center? I, that's, the, that's the word I learned. <laughs> now, I don't have a problem with that. No. So, uh, <laughs> but if we could say that this point is the point of 
strongest and mm -hmm. I don't want to use the word pure because that produces problems, I think. The perfect will of God, let's say. Yes. Okay. But at any rate, I'm trying to talk to those that are either not in the circle or out of the circle, and yet I, I hope there's something in there so that even Christians can find help from it. Those that are well don't need a physician, but those that are sick do. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah. Reach those that are sick. They're the ones that really need Okay. I'm you know, I, may I say, uh, I think that what I'm trying to do is something that a man did whom I have long admired. He inspired me when I was a seminary student. I've never met the person. He's now in glory. And that was Samuel Shoemaker. Mm. But Sam Shoemaker, ha of all of the things he wrote, I think there's something that has just become an intricate part of me. I wish I could quote it. It's very poetic. And even referring to it without quoting it accurately is doing it injustice. But let me say, it's entitled, I Stand at the Door. I stand at the door. Metaphorically, he's standing at the door of the cathedral, see. And he said, there are those inside the church calling me to come in and enjoy the sacrament with them. And there are others that call for me to come forward to the altar and perform the holy sacrament and to listen to them and to hold them and praise God with them. But I have to stand at the door because I'm trying <laughs> to reach those that are running by on the sidewalks, not even knowing what's happening. And someone has to stand at the door and, not, if nothing more, smile and say, we love you. Mm. But to hold the job of standing at the door is very difficult because it's not enough to satisfy frequently those inside, and frequently it's uh, ignored by those that are pounding away you know, on the outside. But someone has to play the role kind for whatever risk, and I think it's a calling. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are those who are called to be inside, those who are called to stand at the door, and that's my calling. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. that. You have a very big door there at Crystal big Cathedral. Well, so <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have big doors, we have little doors. <laughs> What are you trying to say, and I know there are many people viewing this program tonight in many parts of the country who are outside that circle. They, they don't claim to know Christ as Savior. Um, what, what are you saying to them? Well, I, I always like to say what I want to say to them to, till the end, you know? And uh, I, I could never write a book without naming the name of Christ. And uh, hopefully pointing the way of salvation. So in tough times never last, but tough people do. I take two of the wonderful experiences I've had with two well-known personalities. One was uh, Bear Bryant. I tell about my encounter with him on the airplane. Interesting thing. Uh, he, I didn't know his face, and I hate to admit this, but I don't follow the ball. <laughs> I never read the sports book. We there. I don't well, know. I think it's great. You know, my daughter is a su super athlete, but I never got into that. At any rate, this fellow came up to the, me on the plane. He says, Are you Dr. Shuler? <laughs> don't grab my voice, you know. <laughs> I never miss your television program. <laughs> I said, he's, My name is Bear Bryant. And then I stood up. I knew the name, of course. Yes. And I invited him to sit down. <laughs> And then hence became a long conversation, the end of which was, he said, well, I'm not a Christian. And uh, um, but he said, I'd sure like to know that I could go to heaven when I die. Mm -hmm. I asked him why he thought he wasn't a Christian. I asked him what blocked him from becoming a Christian. Finally, uh, I said, well, I can tell you one thing. I can give you the assurance that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. He said, how can you do that? I said, if you will accept the promise that Christ made, and I took out one of these cards out of the pocket, and I wrote on there the words of our Lord, Him that cometh unto me I will in no eyes cast out. And I said, this is the promise of Jesus. He died for me. I believe it. I accept it. And I drew a line. And I said, there. That's the simple contract. If you sign it mm. and carry that with you in your hand and you get to heaven, and if you do so with sincerity and with genuine sorrow, you know, for the wrongs and the sins of your life, which you know, the sorrow is obvious. Yes. It was with him. So I said, sign it. Stuck it in front of him. He said, I don't know if I can sign that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't be sure that I should sign that. I said, I can't be sure this plane's going to land either. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll sign, <laughs> sign it. I'll sign it. He signed it. It was wonderful. And then uh, I said, now leave that. Yes. 
It cannot be a ritual. We're saved by a relationship, not a ritual. By faith, by grace through faith, not by works. An altar call doesn't save you. Just repeating the sinner's prayer doesn't save you. Making that commitment doesn't save you. It is grace that saves. God's mercy. But all of these are acts that can allow God's grace to give it, to do its redemptive work. So I said, fold it up, carry it in your billfold. He did. He folded it up in his billfold. Now that happened, oh, interestingly enough, and he's a tough guy. He said, oh, yeah. Uh, that happened, and I never told it. I felt it was one of these stories I shouldn't tell. Then one Sunday in the pulpit of the Crystal Cathedral, I told it. Uh, how do I say it? Unplanned. Mm -hmm. Spontaneously, mm -hmm. I got into it, and I couldn't get out of it. So I went through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the program went on the, you know, scheduled to be aired two weeks later. Mm -hmm. And two weeks later, when the schedule to be aired, I suddenly, I was out of state, I suddenly realized, oh, goodness, that program has the Bear Bryant story. I can't tell that story. <laughs> Not broadcasted nationwide. Not without his approval. I called my secretary. See if you can reach him. Ask him if he wants it to go or to edit it out. She reached him. This is on a hmm, Thursday or Friday. And he said, I'd be proud to let the world know that I signed Good, that. good, good. Now listen, that happened, and so he aired it on Sunday. And I think it was that next Monday that he died. Yes. I knew he had died. Yeah, oh, yes. My. But the Good. timing of it incredible. was incredible. Oh. The timing was incredible. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. I love that idea of a signed contract. I've never <laughs> thought of that before. Yeah. That's great. I think everybody has. Well, that's one of my favorite Bible verses. You people ask, are you sure you'll go to heaven? I said, absolutely. Because it, you know, this, I used to tell the story. Some, uh, they, they tell the story of the little Scottish lassie. This is, a, this is one that uh, Lloyd John Ogilvy should tell. He probably does. I may even have gotten it from him. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the Scottish lassie was dying, and the pastor said, Lassie, are you sure you'll go to heaven? And, and she said, yes. How can you be sure? Because she said, God would lose more than I. And he said, oh. She said, he would lose his honor. Uh, I would only lose my soul. Mm -hmm. He's promised. Him that comes to me, I will no wise cast out. Oh. Nice. <laughs> well said. Well said. <laughs> and then I then I then I followed that with the story of Duke Wayne, um, and uh, who again is a I don't suppose you could pull two two characters out of recent Americana tougher than any uh, tougher, yeah. Than Duke <laughs> Wayne and uh, Bear Bryant, and uh, and this story uh, I happened at the Queen's luncheon in uh, uh, in uh, Los Angeles when the Queen of England was there. And uh, the mayor had a luncheon for her, and I was honored to be in that group. And uh, a young lady came to me and said, Dr. Schuler, you don't know me, but I know you. And she introduced herself as John Wayne's daughter. She said, I know you and Daddy were friends, and you were a spiritual influence in his life, etc., etc." But she said, I don't know if you know what happened just a couple weeks before he died, and I did not know this, because he had uh, united with the Roman Catholic Church, which was something I rather encouraged him to do, because his whole family is Roman Catholic. And uh, as long as he loves the Lord, that's fine, as far as I'm Amen. concerned. But at any rate, she said, on, one, on sun, the second Sunday before he passed away, you did something you very seldom do. You said at the end of your sermon, maybe there are some of you that have to do, some, do this. Maybe you have to get out of your chair and kneel at that chair and get on your knees and surrender your life, ask the Lord's forgiveness, and with all your heart, Accept him as your Savior and your Lord right now. And she said, my dad at that point was so sick, so sick and uh, dying. But he got out of his hospital bed, Dr. Schuler, and he dropped on his knees. Mm -hmm. And he put his arms and elbows in the bed, and he dropped his head without his hairpiece, she said, on his hands, <laughs> and prayed the prayer. Oh, my. So the point of the book is, you think you're tough? The toughest of the tough aren't tough enough mm -hmm. without the strength of Jesus Christ. Oh, oh amen. Oh, both of those fascinating stories. They're both in there, yeah. Oh. Uh, We've heard we a little story one, about... One little story about John Wayne that was always so special to us. 
um, Southern California Bible School College has a lot of beautiful young girls in it that's right in this area. And a lot of people around in this area use them for babysitters. And uh, one of them got the story back to us that she babysat over at John Wayne's house quite a bit. And she said, every time I'm there to babysit, he has Channel 40 on his television and is watching it. Always said, on one of the sets, always in his home channel 40 is on and that she got the word to us that he watched it just quite a bit and you know just the other night um al kasha who has won all the grammy awards for Emmys. the music that mm -hmm. he's written he was saved watching your program on channel 40 tbn and you know uh, you know he's not ordained no. Yes. Yes. yes, he he took yes. ordination as yes. a minister in uh, First Baptist Church in Van Nuys. Beautiful. Working in ministry there with Jess Moody. Isn't, Isn't that great? incredible? Yeah. Watching your phone, we were safe yeah. and healed. You keep preaching and I'll keep, we'll building, keep building Christian building. TV. Okay, <laughs> that's right. great. That a deal? I love you. All right. One more <laughs> question, Dr. Hugh. Or several more. I'm sure Jan has one or two. What, what is it? There may be no real answer to this, but... What do you think is the main thing that's keeping people from just making that simple decision to know Jesus Christ? Okay, I think the deepest problem in the human being is sin. And I think it's sin that's blocking them from accepting Christ. And I think the core of sin is not something that I do. It is something that I am. Sin is a condition mm -hmm. before it is an action. And the description of the condition that makes sin sin in simple language is a lack of faith an almost in fact I would say a human inability to believe I think that the every human being is conceived and born humanly incapable of believing hmm. and that's what original sin to me that's means a, that's and that's very scriptural yes that's a yes. terrible fix yes and so that I think even f the faith to accept the grace is such a miracle that it itself is one of the first sovereign acts of God through the Holy Spirit. Mm. And so I don't speak of sin in terms of total depravity. I don't think there is such a thing. I think if a person is totally depraved, and we have to take these words literally, mm -hmm. that means if he's totally depraved, if there's no good in him, he ought to be either hanged at the gallows, <laughs> sent to the gas chamber, or at least put away behind bars for life because he's really dangerous. So I don't believe in total depravity, but I do believe in total inability. Mm. Total inability means I, it's, I am totally incapable of doing anything myself to earn or merit the forgiveness of my sins. I am totally dependent upon the grace of God, even to the point of having that initial birth of faith. Hmm. Where does that initial birth of faith I think come that from? initial birth of faith probably happens, well, it happens in different ways, but it happens obviously when a human being encounters God, and that may be through another human life, which I think mm -hmm. more often than not is the case, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I suspect either another human life or, of co or in the scriptures themselves. We all know of people who picked up the book and they didn't believe in it, and suddenly reading the scriptures, something mm -hmm. leaped out at them, and they were converted. Mm -hmm. I believe the scriptures are the word of God, and so the scriptures alone can do it, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. another person. That's why the witness is so important, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. God wanted you on that plane at that moment, didn't he? Yes, I suppose so. Uh, you know, more and more, I'm, I'm beginning to believe, too, that... that that, that prayer is such an ingredient in this. You know, so many people who have a, an unusual testimony of conversion or faith, I've started asking them, did, did you have a, a mother who knew God and prayed, or a grandmother or an aunt or someone? And invariably, there'll be someone in the family or, that was a great prayer, prayer warrior, saint of God, that we really have a responsibility in that area too, don't we? Today? You bet. In fact, the two cases we mentioned both had praying mothers. Did they? Yes. I'm not surprised. Yes. I'm not surprised. Yes. 
Who's the most interesting person that you have ever met, Dr. Shuler, of all the people that you know in this world? Who to you would be the most interesting to you'd like to Well, meet? you know, I don't know. I think the last person, la the last new friend I made, and that's the violinist. I only met him that's last night. <laughs> now, he is so interesting. Yes, he yes. is. He really yes. is. And sweet and cute and bubbly. And have you met his wife? Yeah. She's just a star. Right. <laughs> Oh, phone people are coming? really finding Jesus. Here's Sylvia from El Toro, 52 years old. Someone from Dallas, Texas, 45. Philip from Clinton, New Jersey. Gerald and Mary from Sun Valley. Scott from Ontario. Dale from Balboa. Gary from Compton. Dora from Arleta. Marie from Costa Mesa. Linda from Bellflower. Someone from North Hollywood. And just many, many beautiful praise reports. Mm. Dr. Schuler, uh, if you would uh, take just a moment and end the camera on there, I know somebody's watching tonight that uh, has a divine rendezvous with the Holy Spirit. Would you take a moment from your heart, just one in minute? Invite? Oh, several minutes. Oh, we we're under no work. time pressure here. <laughs> you don't have to cut away for station no. identification. No, sir. <laughs> Fine. Let's pray. Our minds, our Father, like clean blackboards, are wait, ready, waiting for you to write the message. Cross. Amen. Our minds, O oh God, like radio sets, are waiting to receive the signal. Send the sacred sentences into our mind. May Amen. the words take shape. Teach us, O oh God, now to dare, to dare to believe before proof is possible. Father, I pray for someone who's listening now who's never dared to believe in Jesus Christ and doesn't accept the Lord because he's waiting for proof. Remind that wonderful person that when proof is possible, then faith becomes impossible. Oh, Father, is it your will for them now to take the plunge and believe even though they have many doubts? We can hear you say yes. Amen. Father, I am looking at people in prayer who are better people than I am. They may not be Christians. They may not be believers. They may not be walking the religious path. But in their daily life and conduct, their personal behavior may outshine mine. And they may know that very well. But Father, help them to know that no matter how beautiful they are today, they can really become more beautiful if they will only let Christ come in Amen. and shine through. And thank you, Lord, that someone now is keenly aware of their shortcomings and faults and sins. I pray that they may search no further but may stop at the cross of Jesus Christ and know that the young man died there. Justice and mercy kissed each other. He has paid the price. He has earned the credit yes. to extend forgiveness to Amen. all who would accept Praise this gracious and generous gift of eternal life. Father, I see someone who is terribly afraid. I pray now that they may be aware that Christ offers eternal life. Amen. May they accept it, and in conquering the fear of death, they will have conquered the mother of all fears. Yes. And now, Father, I pray for that person who is in despair. Give hope. The hope that there is a beautiful life that they've never tasted. The hope that maybe there's something to this thing called religion after all. Oh, Jesus. Help us. For in the presence of hope, faith is born. In the presence of faith, love becomes a possibility. In the presence of love, miracles happen.
No wonder we love to be close to you, Jesus. For miracles happen when we come close to your love. In your holy name we pray. Thank you for those who are accepting you by faith yes. now. Yes. Amen. 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 So if you were praying along with Dr. Shooter, I feel it in my spirit. And if you will take that next step now that God's word says we should take to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. In other words, sign the contract now. <laughs> <laughs> Move to that telephone. Uh, make that confession of the mouth. That just kind of settles it, signs, seals, and delivers it for all eternity. I don't know. But the word is clear. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So uh, I see phones ringing, Dr. Schuler, and I believe some contracts are being signed right now. That was Praise cute. Lord. That was really cute. Yeah. You should make that as a weekly little gift offer. That little thing for people to sign <laughs> and keep in their home. Wouldn't that be cute? Mm -hmm. You're so welcome. <laughs> 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 That'd be adorable. <laughs> I would love one. Thank you. One, You're welcome. One final question, Doctor. I've, just a little personal note. When, how, how are one of these new books born? Does, oh, does a thought that, just... No, that thing... <laughs> Forgive me for calling it a thing, <laughs> but this thing, this, first of all, this is a non-book. Tough times never last, tough people do, is a book. Mm -hmm. I call this really a non-book. Yeah. A non-book is like a collection of poems or essays. Mm -hmm. This is a daily devotional yeah. guide of all things. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a 366, because it's a leap year, I wrote this to be the daily devotional guide for my church members. Mm -hmm. And the funniest thing has happened, here it is on Time Magazine bestseller list, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. It's <laughs> got to be an act of God. This started because I was in Amsterdam for the Billy Graham Congress last summer, mm -hmm. and uh, my staff sent me the manuscript of my 19, this year's daily devotional, taken from my unpublished writings. It was awful, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I said to my wife, this is impossible. I don't use that word very often. <laughs> I, threw the, I, I threw the manuscript in the wastebasket, and I said, we'll use a rerun. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, why don't we just take my daily devotional book of four years ago, you know, the audience has changed so much, update it, and uh, she said, we can't do that. Well, this was in July. We needed the finished manuscript by September in order to get it manufactured mm -hmm. in the warehouse so that we offered it on the air could be out January 1. You understand yes. the time very well. <laughs> yes, sir. So we had a real crisis. I skipped an afternoon meeting at the Congress. I took my yellow legal pad, sat on the canal, and prayed <laughs> for, Lord, what am I going to do? And I re into my mind flashed a chapter from Move Ahead with Possibility Thinking where I talk about mountain-moving faith in ten words, dreaming, desiring, daring, deciding. <laughs> I forget the others. <laughs> and then I, then I got uh, hung up on this idea that they were all verbs. And then I got on the thought, golly, faith in the English language is only a noun. It's not a verb. That's part of our problem, perhaps. Mm -hmm. We say, I have faith. Bang, it's there on the shelf. I believe in those creeds. I accept that doctrine. You know, I practice this holy ritual. It's all there on the shelf, mm -hmm. you see. It's a noun, not a verb. It's mm -hmm. not inside of me. I wondered, I thought, if I could take those ten verbs and stretch them out to 365. Mm. And I thought, so that's, that's going to be a toughie. But I thought, I know what I can do. And I used my own material. Beginning is half done, you know. Mm. I, I, I sat down and I started writing on the legal pad from 1 to 365. It took me about 30 minutes. Oh my and goodness. after 30 minutes, I had finished. I had written 1 to 365, right? And then I wrote down the ten verbs. And then I assumed that if our faith is valid and authentic, it ought to relate to every aspect of our existence. And if that was an adequately fair assumption, then any verb in the English language ought to reflect some aspect of faith. So I wrote down all of these verbs, and out of it came, like faith is trusting the unprovable. Faith is dreaming God's dream. It's breathing your native air. Faith is doubting your doubts. Faith is... Uh, Batting all alone. Faith is sitting in the front row. Ha, 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 ha. That's good. Faith is knocking down the high bar. Faith is whistling in the dark. Faith is uh, 
uh, thinking God's thoughts. It's praying for guidance. Faith is setting a goal. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I think it took me about uh, th three days to come up with these verbs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I went out and I bought a video cassette and uh, we took a five-day river boat right up the... And I sat and did nothing but dictated all the thoughts that came to me from the topic. And uh, then I f had to make a quick trip to Washington for the booksellers' convention. I dictated uh, anything that would come out of me, praying constantly, constantly, <laughs> as if I was a car with a sunroof, open all the time, <laughs> and just dictating. And... Uh, Back to Amsterdam, and from Amsterdam, let's see, I went to Honolulu. From Honolulu with Paul Yonhi Cho, mm -hmm. you know, at his evangelism oh, yes. thing mm -hmm. in yes, Japan, yes. and all the way to Japan, from Japan to Honolulu. And in Honolulu, I sat on the beach for six days and just dictated and dictated, and in about six days, I mean about six weeks all told, I had this huge collection of cassettes, and I guarded them as if it was the gold bars of Fort Knox, <laughs> and I got on a plane and I dumped them off in my secretary's office, and she got a whole bunch of people to take it down, and it turned out to be 366 essays, true enough, but 2,000 pages, and it had to be edited down to 366. That all went to my wife, God bless her, mm -hmm. and my wife and my daughter, Sheila, they worked day and night cutting down 2,000 pages to 366, mm. and they sent it off to the publishers, and they tried to put it, patch it all together, and they, out it came, and uh, here it is. Is there a favorite one in there that you would read a little portion for Oh, or in fact, there, I, I, yes, there is, because it's an interesting thing, 272, because it's got me going on a whole new book. Um, Scott Peck, with whom I agree sometimes, <laughs> says in, one, in his book, The Road Less Traveled, he has a line there that I really helped me about a few months ago. He said, the subconscious is always ahead of the conscious. Mm -hmm. Now that fits in good with theology. That explains how the Holy Spirit can speak words out of your mouth and you hear yourself say it, but you don't think it. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's coming out of here before it ever mm -hmm. comes out of here. Mm -hmm. I was using the word verb combining, and when I looked at what I wrote, I had written, faith is combining contradictions creatively. And I thought, gosh, that's pretty, sounds very smart. What in the world does it mean? <laughs> and the foggiest idea what it meant. <laughs> what can I do with that, you know? And uh, so I picked the Bible verse, Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, let it be to you. Because at that point, that's what I needed more than anything else. What was the original okay, thought again? Possibil uh, Combining contradictions creatively. Hmm. Possibility thinkers who walk this walk of faith are successful because they've learned yet another principles. principle. Contradictions that creatively clash often open a treasure house of undiscovered values. Designers, architects, musicians, and chefs, you know, sweet, sour, mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the uh, point and counterpoint, music, architect, uh, Carpet against stone, mm -hmm. contradicting mm -hmm. tones and qualities, you see. Uh, yellow, orange, blue, purple. They put it in a lady's blouse and it's fantastic. <laughs> and the bottom line I've come to the conclusion is, is a contradiction. In all of life, in biology, it's male and female. Combine them creatively and you have a family. In moral philosophy, it's justice and mercy. Mm -hmm. Combine them creatively, which is what happened on the cross, and mm. you've got salvation. Isn't that exciting? That's great. And uh, it's in all of life. The, contra the problem we have within us is the contradiction of uh, the carnal and the spiritual. And I think a lot of what is carnal has to be redeemed more than destroyed. Because mm -hmm. many people would say that sexual impulses are carnality. Well, sex is not to be obliterated. It's to be redeemed and brought under the control of God. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a part of the creative process again of the family. Uh, the Bible is a contradiction. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The doctrine of law and grace. <laughs> what a contradiction. And yes. They combine creatively to form one holy word. Uh, I'll put that away when I say that. Oh, my one goodness. One holy word. You know? <laughs> yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> Jesus was a contradiction. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Very God of very God and very man of very man. Yes, yes. The problems we're having in the church today is because we don't want to recognize that there are contradictions. 
or if we recognize them, we want to take sides and take only one side. That forces people to become fundamentalists, and by that I mean people who have to continue to define narrower and narrower do's and don'ts of what is really good, good. holier than holier than holier than holier. And so then you come up with those are the kind of people that can't handle contradictions. And it was that kind of mentality that crucified Jesus because they saw contradictions in Jesus. A rabbi? And look, he was dealing with the harlots and the sinners and uh, they couldn't handle that. And people who can't combine contradictions will become crucifying people. Then they, then they don't want to admit that there are contradictions in their own life, so they pretend they've, they've got it all mm. together, and then they become hypocritical, then they're putting mm. on a false front, and then they're having an awful time wearing their mask and being something they're not really are. So this whole thing mm. called contradictions, I'm very excited about it. We try to set up a contradiction between the secular and the sacred. The world is doing this today, and so is the Christian church. In what way? Well, the Christian church, well, I'll give you, for instance, in architecture, they'll say, this church building is strictly a sacred building, so it has to have this kind of an altar, this kind of a pulpit, you understand, this kind of a lecture, this kind of a religious theatrical set. Mm-hmm. And uh, it better not be secular looking. Well, <laughs> I think that uh, I think that what we have to do is combine the sacred and the secular. Well, that's why we built the kind of building we did. Mm -hmm. You can come into the Crystal Cathedral to the religious; it can be religious. To the secular, it's not threatening. Mm -hmm. We are combining the contradictions creatively, architecturally. Let me uh, uh, and let me illustrate another thing. Uh, the church in the mission is a contradiction. You know, I get, I'm misunderstood by a lot of fundamental Christians because I'm combining contradictions. They're separating them. You yeah. bet. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me show you the contradiction in the scriptures. The contradiction in the scriptures between the mission and the church. See, There are those who see it only as a church. And then they ride high on the verse, have nothing to do, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. Mm -hmm. And then here are those who read the words of Jesus, go out in the highways and the byways and <laughs> compel them to yes. come in. So we have in the scriptures, on the one hand, a call to be the ecclesia, the separated, the chosen, the set apart yes. people. It's very definitely there. Yes. I recognize that. I accept that. The also, on the other hand, is a supposedly con a seemingly contradiction. And so you have the contradiction, as I say, between the church and the mission. Both are right. Mm -hmm. Neither one should be outlawed. Both have to be combined creatively, and then you get what we had in Iowa, the John Deere tractor, two, uh, in, two, cen two cylinders, pop, 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 pop. Yes, and so if yes, a, church, a church has to constantly be dying as a church, born again as a mission. A mission has to mature as a church, or it'll fail as a mission. So these are contradictions. That's oh, what I'm into. Oh, fantastic. Have you named the new book yes, yet? Yes, I've got a name. What is what it? What is it? Can you tell us yet? Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what we're going to use, but I kind of like it. The title is Win or Lose, But Succeed Always. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa, I like that. Okay. I that love it. I love it. But it all came out of 273. Oh, Any... Uh, Oh, I could keep you here all night on that subject alone. That's Please fabulous. come back when that one comes out, and let's talk about that some more. Yeah. That is beautiful. And it's in all of life. Do you want me to go on a minute? Oh, yes. Just a little Please. bit. For instance, that's what you asked why some people don't believe, mm -hmm. why they don't accept Jesus. They don't know how to handle contradictions. Let me illustrate. Mm -hmm. Within myself, a part of me says, I want security. Another part says, I want excitement. Well, that's a contradiction. Sure. So how do you combine the, because as soon as you leave security for stimulation and, secure, uh, and excitement, you're going to run risk. You mm -hmm. might get hurt. You might make some wrong decisions. Mm -hmm. How do you combine that contradiction creatively? As far as I'm concerned, I do it in Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, once I'm related to Jesus Christ, he's going to give me some daring ideas. I'm going to be filled with excitement because I've constantly, I've got so many projects going on, I don't have time. 
to be worried about my problems. <laughs> you know, Good. my goals distract me from my fears. Yeah. Good. So uh, I, that gives me security, but I also have excitement. I want freedom. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but on the other hand, I don't want loneliness. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you combine those contradictions creatively? Through commitment. Mm -hmm. um, I want uh, safety, but I also want to succeed. And you can't possibly succeed by playing it safe. You'll never advance till you take a chance. You see, how do you combine that creatively? It's called courage. So I could go on and on, but thanks for ca thanks for having me here, and especially thanks for the people that you share the faith with, Paul and Jan. I am constantly shocked at the people that I meet saying that they watch you and you and even me yes. and we all do our little bit and it's isn't it wonderful to know that we're all his people right. so Amen. i don't want to take any more time you got lloyd john ogilvy and any, you, any you, you exciting things coming up at crystal cathedral in the next few days or weeks oh You'd yes like next sunday mother's day. mother's day what are you yes. doing special what am i doing special well somebody's going to find the Lord. They do every week. Yeah. We expect that. We believe it and pray. That's exciting. You can't top that, right? No, Shane, Me. <laughs> Jane Meadows is going to be my guest. Oh, both great. services. Oh, and uh, we have great music, you know. Uh, Fred Swan is our organ master, choir director, and he's very, very, very picky about the music. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very good. But, guess what? He had an anthem submitted to him, and we get tons of this stuff offered to us. And it's all so good, it's hard to know what to say no to. But he had, uh, and some of it isn't that good. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, at any rate, he, we had an anthem sent to us a while back, and they, it all comes to me. Mm. I sent it straight to Fred Swan. Mm. And he, he, he played it, and he said, this is good. Played it again, he, it's real good. He looked at the composer, hmm, unknown. Played it again, he says, great checked on the composer to find out that the composer is 92 years old. I will. <laughs> and we will be performing her anthem, and she her. will be accompanying on the piano oh herself with her 92-year-old nimble oh, ten on. fingers. True. That's this beautiful. Sunday morning, two services, Crystal Cathedral. Beautiful. Great. Fantastic. So Where are we going to be? We, uh, need, uh, we need to be there for that. All of you 92 <laughs> or 3-year-old saints, get going. Start writing music. That's Praise right. God. Oh, Let's tell Dr. Robert Schuler it's been great to have him on praise. We appreciate you stopping Thank by. Thank you. Come again. Soon, Thank you. Please. Thank you. The Hawaiians, my soul, doth magnify the Lord. Let's give them another great praise welcome as they lift us in music.
For he hath shown the strength of his hand, and exalted the clouds in his heart. He hath put down the feet of the mighty, and exalted the lowly He has filled the hungry with good things. You know, uh, while the Hawaiians get ready to do a, another little song right now, uh, I kind of sensed you, uh, you know, itching over here with some, uh, and it just didn't seem to open up, but you've got some tremendous support scriptures, what Dr. Shuler was just yeah, talking you know, about, don't you? If, if, if the world could just realize that, that every, from every place, in this world, from every spiritual place, should I say, from someone who just, like a little baby, says, yes, Jesus, they're in the kingdom, to someone who has gone as far in the kingdom and given as many years as a Catherine Kuhlman or Dad Bill Heimer, or we're all in the kingdom of God. And there are contradictions in every life because we are, like he said, all reaching for the same goal. But we sure aren't all there yet. And some of us come from such diverse backgrounds. Some of us come from some, such diverse cultures. Some come from such diverse teachings. And just everything is so different. And yet we're still striving for the same goal. I know that there was the problem of the contradictions even in Jesus. And, and what I was, the point I want to make that, you know, wherever you are and what, whatever uh, place you are in life or whatever... Um, place you feel that you have to be to become a Christian. No, just come to Jesus right where you are and come on in to the kingdom right where you are. We need you with maybe your your point of view or whatever is in your life. We need you in the body of Jesus Christ. Don't think you have to get anywhere to no. get in. Just come just where yeah, you that's are. That's the biggest mistake I think people think. They think they have to reform themselves first and reach some 
level of goodness before God will accept him. Oh, no, all of our goodness in God's sight, the Bible says, is nothing but filthy rags anyway. I love that old song. Uh, Billy Graham has it sung every invitation, just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come just, just like I am. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. And then Jesus puts us in the kingdom and then... Then the change begins. Then the washing and ironing. Then the uh, sanctification, whatever theological term you want to put on. That's such an important point. Just come to Jesus just like you are. And he'll do the changing. Oh, and I love what Dr. Schuler said. I'm afraid so many people have been driven away from God and driven away from the church because of all the you can't do this and you can't do that. And holiness is something that you either hang on your ear or don't hang on your ear or something you put around your neck. Boy, we've had holiness so messed up. It's just ridiculous. Holiness is an attitude of heart. You are holy when you come to know Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. Somebody say amen over there real quick or I'm going to bust down here. You know, I, what, I think one of the saddest things to me in the world is to see beautiful, good people. Good people that do good things, wonderful things. And yet they'll say, well, I'm better than that Christian I know. You very well may be. But see the difference is that person has said, Jesus, will you help me be better? And they might not be better yet, but they're going to get better. And that's <laughs> what's great. You're already better. So all you have to do is just ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You know, even, even back then, when Jesus walked on the earth, there were such contradictions. These people are like little children playing who say to their little friends, we played wedding and we weren't happy. And we played funeral and we weren't sad. For John the Baptist doesn't even drink wine and often goes without food. And you say, why, he's crazy. Mm. And I, the Messiah, feast and I drink. And you complain that I am a glutton and a drinking man and hang around with this sort of sinners. See, there's everybody in the kingdom. Just come on in, okay? <laughs> Just ask Jesus to come into your heart wherever you are. We love you and we need you in the body of Jesus. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Oh, I'll never forget that wonderful word that Dr. Schuler shared with us. I'll always remember that. I want us to cut one little section out where he said, that's impossible. <laughs> then he <laughs> quickly said, that. but I don't use that term very often. <laughs> That'd make a great little addition to the blooper tape, wouldn't it, guys? <laughs> to have Dr. Schuler. We have a little fun. We'll tease him a bit. Um, we really appreciate him stopping by tonight. And we have another wonderful friend stopping by in just a little bit, Dr. John Lloyd Ogilvy is a wonderful man, and he's written a brand new book. This is kind of media night, isn't it, tonight, with all of these wonderful books and the fact that we have Christian television. The word is going out, and we're so excited about that. The Hawaiians, come on, let's sing another song. And then uh, Alex Shoney Brown, where are you? Let's have another great number on the violin, and then we'll have a wonderful time with Dr. Ogilvy. The Hawaiians, bring Back the springtime. Welcome them one more time to Paris.
Lord, make me like that stream that flows so cool and clear. Down from the mountains high above, and I will tell the world the wondrous story of that precious stream filled with your love. Lord, to my heart bring back. Mark and Diane Yasahara, the Hawaiians. What a joy to have them back with us tonight. Just before uh, Alex Shoney Brown brings another of those great numbers on the violin, let's meet our next wonderful friend. Dr. Ogilvy really is, is no guest around here. He's part of the family. And uh, besides the family of the Lord, he's a part of this TBN family because his very beautiful television program airs each week across the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Dr. Lloyd John Ogilvy is the senior pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Hollywood, California. He's well known across the land for his ministry at conferences and special meetings on radio and television and his weekly syndicated TV program, Let God Love You, is seen in many parts of the land. He has authored many best-selling books, his latest, Falling Into Greatness. From Hollywood First Presbyterian Church, let's welcome Dr. Lloyd John Ogilvy. You made it. You made it. <laughs> that's our. Uh, that's kind of our initiation course to. Uh, the, you made it. Everything else is easy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> We're delighted to have you here tonight. How are you? I'm fine. It's been a full day, but you know. Everything kind of fit together because I knew I was going to be with you folks and we'd have a wonderful visit uh, yes, tonight. In fact, you were just with another fine Presbyterian pastor, Galloway. George Galloway, that we didn't get to meet back in Florida. We, but he opened the doors of his church and we had a great week That's of revival. Right, you had a revival in his church. You know, it's interesting. Uh, George and I are a part of a fellowship group of Presbyterian pastors across the nation. We have a covenant to pray for each other and we meet once a year to uh, think through what God wants to do in our time and open ourselves to him and then learn how we can be supportive of each other. So he's a great brother. Well, I'll tell you, that church welcomed us with open arms and I mean, we had revival right there in the First Presbyterian, no, Church of the New Covenant. Yes. Church of the New Covenant, the, a church that Catherine Marshall was right. uh, instrumental in founding, and um, we just are still kind of tingling with excitement from that great week down there. Many hundreds found Jesus as their Savior and called in coast to coast. And the elders, I have to say a little word, there were <laughs> some of the sweetest <laughs> elders I have ever met. And every one of you, we love you and thank you for making us feel absolutely at home. 
we want to come back, Kay. <laughs> we really do. It was super. We loved it. We want to get into your new book, Donko. In fact, I've got two of your books down here, one on the power of prayer, and uh, so we'll just take the rest of the program to let the Holy Spirit do whatever he wants to do, all right? Praise God. Have you met uh, Alex Shoney Brown? Why don't we walk over and say hello to him? Meet Dr. Lloyd John Ogilvie. Lots of good folks get to meet on this program. I know that. Honor to meet you. I heard you play earlier in the program and was so inspired. Thank you. That was a small composition of mine. Uh, a small one. <laughs> <That's all laughs> How modest. Thank you. It was titled When Israel Dances. Yes. And with your permission, I'd love to play another composition of mine for your Spanish listening audience, Serenara Español and El Relicario. Now, the first one is my composition, the second one is not. And please may I introduce yes. Yes. my very talented and capable companist, Mr. James Gina, at the piano. Yeah. This gentleman is rated. Okay. He's, he's probably the only one who can make the piano sound like a cymbal. Yes. And this is quite a, a, a talent, really. So I'm honored to have him tonight. Thank you. I like Shoney Brown. Give him one more great big praise welcome as he <laughs> plays for us.
Shoney Brown. What a, what a talent. I, it just blows my mind to think of the hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of <laughs> years. practice. Years, years of practice that must have taken. And uh, I uh, believe we have gotten a commitment from Alex and his wife to go with us to Israel yeah. in the fall. Uh, he bows in uh, consent, I believe, and we'll tell you more about that, but I can just imagine we, we would have both poles yes. of the music world. Andre, Andre Crouch, Crouch is, is going, going with us <laughs> and, and Alex Shoney Brown. I mean, there'd be something for everyone then, wouldn't there? <laughs> All right. Dr. Ogilvy, uh, before we dive into, uh, well, maybe even a couple of your you're, this is kind of media night tonight, as I said to Jan, and, and thank God for books and yeah. radio and Christian yeah. television, the mass communication media that's really getting the word out, and we thank God you're a part of, well, we just kind of feel like you're a part of our TBN family here. You know, Jen and Paul, when I saw Alex playing, I thought to myself, that's the way I want to live, you know, with yes. such gusto and yeah. freedom, and, you know. <laughs> The confidence that he has over years of training and practice, mm -hmm. uh, that same kind of confidence can be ours because Christ lives in us and Amen. we know that there's an unlimited resource and therefore we can live with freedom and joy. I remember one time I was uh, in the uh, uh, tabernacle in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. It was a great big old tabernacle uh, and uh, the organist was playing uh, a mighty fortress is our God. And the, the rafters were around. And uh, he just soared higher and higher. And I thought the place was going to fall down. And I leaned over and I said to a man next to me, what in the world is happening? He said, nothing at all. The organist has pulled out all of the stops. <laughs> and, you know, as I got up to uh, preach, I took a hold of the pulpit looked down at my text, and I had it all memorized, ready to go, and the Lord said, Lloyd, what would happen if you pulled out all of the stops? Whoa! <laughs> and, you know, I suddenly realized that so often I kind of have reservations. The stops are half out, you know. And, uh, Even when in I preaching? Saw, <laughs> you, you, sure. <laughs> and, uh, and God says, pull out all the stops. Let me play my music on you. Good. And, uh, is a, when I heard Alex playing, I thought of that marvelous story of the time a stranger went to a cathedral in Europe and asked to play the, the organ, and the uh, uh, sexton almost refused, but he begged that he might be able to play it, and finally played it and pulled out all the stops and played magnificently, and uh, the sexton said, who are you? And he said, Mendelssohn. <laughs> and so I thought, hello. I'd like the Lord to play his music on me uh, fully and non reservedly. Excuse me, I got uh, moved by what Alex did. I think he, I think he does sometimes, Dr. Ogilvy. I'll, I'll never forget a sermon you preached on witnessing one time. It still lingers really? in my mind. Really? Yes, maybe oh. two years ago. One of the most you masterful. Made my day. No, I mean it sincerely. Thank you. One of the most masterful messages I ever heard in my life preached on. You made me want to go out and join up with Arthur Blessed or somebody and get out on the street. It was great. It really was. You know, Dr. Ovi, that gusto that you were talking about, that yes. life that we can live to its fullest. Have you ever known of anybody that thinks Christians shouldn't live gusto and joyful and happy and just be... Oh, we can be all the time. Well, Jan, it's, it's strange that sometimes religion or the rules and regulations of the creeds and, and our structures and our uh, constraints and traditions uh, take that away from us. Mm -hmm. And what we reproduce in other people is not a gusto and a verve for life, but uh, the rigidity. We become the contemporary Pharisees and... Mm. I long for the church to uh, be filled with Christ's Spirit so fully that we know that we have resources that uh, are unlimited. I think the reason that we, we are so cautious is because we're uncertain that if we get in a tight spot, we're not going to make it. Mm. And <laughs> we depend on our own strength, and as a result, uh, we've had just enough times of failure on our own strength that then we... Uh, hedge our bets and are very careful and worrisome mm -hmm. 
Uh, and once we begin to live in the flow of the Spirit of God, then we begin to relax. And I find I get to a place in every situation, in every day, where I have to uh, let go. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I thought that all I'd have to do is make a once never to be repeated commitment to Jesus Christ, receive his indwelling spirit, be baptized with his power, receive his gifts that he's uh, so ready to give, and then that would be the end of it. But I find that there's a, a, a moment in every sermon that I preach when I say, Lord, you take charge. <laughs> All right. And All right. every time I'm talking with someone about the faith, uh, I say, Lord, you take charge. <laughs> you know, and I just, <laughs> and, and then, whoosh, that's when the power comes through. That can be kind of a scary little moment, though, at times, oh, can't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what really faith is, isn't it? It's that leap into <laughs> Oh, I, I think so. <laughs> it is. It's yeah. soaring into God's arms. But isn't it wonderful that God has created us to be a riverbed for the flow of His Spirit? Mm -hmm. Amen. And Amen. all we're responsible to do is to be the riverbed, to let His Spirit flow through, mm -hmm. and Good. not to be the, the, the water of the river. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, no. we, try <laughs> <laughs> well, we try and do that. That's when we get clutched. You're in trouble when you try to do that. We hear that term a lot, you know, Spirit-filled. We, we chatted yes, just a moment yes. about it. Uh, I, you know, all of a sudden we're hearing about spirit-filled Catholic churches even, and spirit-filled Presbyterian churches, spirit-filled whatever. But what, what, what do you, how do you explain that definition? Or well, I'm it? fascinated by the fact that in the book of Acts, Luke talks about an essential filling that begins the Christian life, in which we're given the gift of faith, which is the primary gift, opening us to the flow of the Spirit, and then all of the other gifts Paul listed in uh, the 12th chapter of Corinthians follow after that great gift of faith. No one says that Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then follows the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the gift of uh, healing, the gift of being able to praise God in His own implanted language. All of this comes as a result of His Spirit in us. <coughs> but I believe that a spirit-filled Christian is not only a person who's been baptized in the Spirit, but a person who in each situation, as I mentioned before, receives a fresh anointing for the particular challenge mm -hmm. that's before him. As someone said, the need before us produces the gift from within us. Mm. It's unique and special for that situation. And I feel that uh, uh, the difference between that beginning filling and then the constant day-by-day -day filling uh, for each situation is the secret of living a victorious life. Christ lives in us. That's the most uh, dynamic fact of life. Mm -hmm. Above and beyond all the circumstances, Christ lives in us. Uh, we've died to self, and we're alive in Him. You know, I love Paul's word in Galatians uh, uh, 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, mm. but Christ who lives Amen. in me. And the life he lives, uh, and the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. Mm. And that's the secret for me. Yeah. Mm. You know, what I'm coming to understand more and more, and, and here again, like Dr. Schuler said, we have kind of a, almost a contradiction. Yes. The filling of the Spirit. Well, when does the Holy Spirit come in? Certainly when one is regenerated and born again. So the Spirit is within me if I am Christ's, right? Yes. So I'm beginning to believe that it's, it's more an exercise of releasing the Spirit that is already, in some cases, almost trapped within me and, and letting Him flow out of me or be that riverbed, as you said, mm -hmm. to meet whatever the appropriate need may be at the moment. It may be one of the manifestations of the Spirit that is needed, perhaps a word of prophecy or a, 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 a miracle of healing or, or whatever. But th does that ring yes, a bell at all? I think that there's such a thin line between uh, our own talent and a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we try and live by talent, mm -hmm. manifesting 
our own strength and training. Uh, but a gift from the Spirit is, it just maximizes our talent and goes so far beyond anything we could do by ourselves. You know, we study and acquire knowledge, but that's not wisdom. No. Mm. Wisdom is the divine implanting of uh, insight and discernment, which we couldn't have acquired by ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I spoke recently to a, a group of, of non-Pentecostal. Uh, I've come from the old classic tradition sure. of Pentecostal roots and heritage. And the Holy Spirit just led me to, to say, you know, on behalf of some Pentecostals at least, I want to apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, some of us, classic Pentecostals, have demanded mm -hmm. that everyone experience the gifts, the manifestations, and the operations of the Holy Spirit only as we mm -hmm. had experienced them. And yeah, if mean. you didn't get it the way we got it or release it the way we released it or have the jerk of the neck just the <laughs> way we had it or whatever, you weren't Pentecostal. Yes. And really, we did yes. that. And that was a classic mistake you know, that we made. We weren't using one of the beautiful, beautiful manifestations of the Spirit, which is wisdom. And if yes. we had used wisdom, we would have said, <laughs> all Good. of them can come from time to time as you need them. I have seen some beautiful people use wisdom that was just unbelievable, and yet maybe they never spoke in tongues. Later, I hope they do, you sure. know, because it's so beautiful. But that's not the qualification. That's it. Yes. We should we, use wisdom mainly along with whatever else God you has You know what given. was even worse? For some reason, we took, and I know why, because of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1. Yes. We took tongues as the only initial evidence of the baptism or release or whatever theological term you want to put on, as the only badge that you were quote-unquote spirit-filled. And didn't use the others. And if, if you weren't spirit-filled, well, God bless you, you were okay. I, we kind of allowed as how you would get to heaven, <laughs> but you would go kind of as a second or third class Christian mm -hmm. uh, with none of the blessing and none of the power and none of the... Uh, I'll, I'll tell you who changed my whole life on that. And as God would have it, a, a classic little Southern Baptist <laughs> brother by the name of Arthur Blessed, yes. who told me the story of how he was baptized or released or whatever you wish to call it in the Holy Spirit. He, he was in one of those old dry, dead seminaries, cemeteries they're called sometimes, <laughs> trying to learn the Bible. And he got so hungry for just more of God. He didn't know what he wanted. He just was hungry for God, more of God. And he began to seek God for what? He didn't know. And he said one night, the precious presence of the Lord just entered his dorm room and just, he said the room literally lit up. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he was just bathed in wave after wave of the glory of God. Well, the next morning he got up absolutely what? radical. I mean, he, he, he was on fire. He was witnessing. He, witness. he, he was out on the street. He was leading people to Jesus. He got so radical, they finally kicked him out of the <laughs> seminary. And now he said, Paul, don't you dare tell me that I was not gloriously baptized or filled or overflowed or released in the Holy Spirit. He says, I was. Mm -hmm. But he said, two years later, I began to speak with my heavenly language and in yes. my new tongue. So that changed my whole theology. And, and I... I've checked this out later with some other classical Pentecostals like C.M. Ward and Jack yes. Hayford and others. Right. And they say, Paul, we are all coming to believe that that, that was a fundamental mistake. Mm -hmm. that we, we demanded that the Presbyterians <laughs> speak in tongues or they weren't filled <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And we were wrong. And I do apologize. <laughs> now then, in your church, the gifts of the Spirit do flow and operate, don't they? Beautifully. We believe in all of the gifts for all of the people. Mm -hmm for all situations as guided by the Spirit of God. Well said. Yes. And I feel that uh, the Lord gives his gifts for ministry. And that's a, perhaps the greatest mistake that uh, along with uh, putting people under pressure that we've made about the gifts of the Spirit. That they're all for ministry. Jesus Christ is up to uh, communicating his love and power and forgiveness and hope and healing uh, to individuals in the world. Mm -hmm. and seeking for us to become involved 
in the crisis situations around us in our society. And he equips us with his spirit for that ministry. Amen. And once we get involved beyond our own strength and dare to do things we couldn't do on our own, then he supplies what we don't have within ourselves. Glory. And the reason for the yes. church being so dead in the world today is simply because we're living on a human level. I think I may have mentioned to you in our conversations that I feel that the greatest tragedy among church leaders is that we're doing what we could do without the Holy Spirit anyhow. Mm. You know, we plan our budgets, we plan yes, our yes. programs, our sermons uh, on the basis of human energy and not the flow of the dynamic power of God. Mm -hmm. And what he is constantly doing is trying to press us out yes. with challenges that throw us back on him and say, Lord, I can't do it. And he says, I never meant you to. <laughs> you know, well, let me through. Oh, and amen. then there it is. he does what we couldn't do there it ourselves. Is. And then he gets the glory for it. Then. That's right. Yes, yes. Oh, mm. this is rich. Yeah. This is good. Right. We do want to get into falling into greatness here in a moment. Is, uh, is somebody ready to sing a song? Uh, and then we'll segue on into... Oh, my. We've got a couple of books here. Praying with Power, Falling into Greatness, and then... As time permits, uh, if you will, uh, I know this man can take a text <laughs> and open the Word and, like few others, Thank preach you. the Word. And if uh, that liberty is yours, if, uh, if the preach comes on you, <laughs> you take off, all right? Well, you know, uh, Jan and Paul, these are our people, our family. Yes. You have made me a part of your family oh, here in Channel 40. We love it. We're so thankful to have the privilege of airing our program. And I want to tell you a story about a woman in Florida who watches this program uh, through your uh, marvelous network. Uh, she was in Los Angeles for a funeral. And God blessed in that funeral. It was a double funeral where, where two uh, loved ones had died. Mm. And through the blessing of the Spirit of God, this woman sensed God's hope in her life and the rest of the family were transformed from grief into hope mm -hmm. through the presence of the Spirit of God. Well, she went back to Florida, Sanibel, Florida, and uh, was told that she had a very serious kidney disease. And one day was rushed to the hospital and given a very grim prognosis for her illness. And she felt so alone and bereft. And she said to herself, oh, how I wish I could feel again the way I felt at the conclusion of that funeral when the Spirit of God seemed to give me hope. And she was in her uh, hospital room all by herself. And someone had taken the remote control of the television set and placed it on the bed beside her. And Almost in despair, she raised her hands and said, Oh, God, help me. And she <laughs> hit the, the remote control and whoop, onto the set Channel came, 45. The, came oh. our program. Oh. And I was saying, The oh. Lord will never leave you nor forsake oh. you. Lo, I'm with oh. you always. I love it. I and love it. So, oh, my. And I think of you two dear people and, and the family that... Uh, that lives and works and prays and supports uh, mm. the ministry we all share together. It's for dear people like that and for so many listening to us right now uh, who desperately need the Lord and who are crying out, Lord, help me. And right at this moment, he's saying, I'm right here with you and I'm right there with you and I love you. You know, many, many needs have come in, Dr. Ogilvy, and this just seems to be a real good time to to lift the many who are hurting and who are in despair. Mm -hmm. We have hundreds of needs from literally all over the country. Um, some of these, the doctor says, is, is impossible with man. Mm -hmm. But with God, all things are possible. So if you're hurting tonight, move to the telephone. We have a beautiful prayer partner that'll pray with you, talk with you, be your friend. 
and uh, for the many who have called in or who are calling in, would you share maybe just a few, darling, that might be representative of the many? Here's someone just in a very bad mental state and needs a miracle from Fort Lauderdale, from Colorado, just needs a job real bad. And from uh, Julie, just has heart trouble and is asking for prayer from Houston, Texas. Pray for Mary. She said, I just have a very bad problem in my life. From uh, Tucson, Arizona, sentenced to life without parole mm -hmm. um, and needs strength to go through this. From Littletown, Ohio, unable to walk, something wrong with her leg. From Hazard, Kentucky, needs prayer tonight. From Orange Pearl, Florida, a son, only eight years old, who has heart trouble. From just all over, Sun City, Arizona, needs a miracle. From Michigan, lung problems. From Seattle, Washington, wants to receive her heavenly language. Mm -hmm. All right, Beautiful. you may. And just so many needs to Amen. All right. Dr. Ogilvy, would you just lead us in our prayer? Let's agree for these needs tonight. Mm -hmm. Blessed living Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, God. <laughs> we believe that you are here as we lay our hands mm -hmm. on these pieces of paper. Yes, Lord. But more than that, we believe that you are right next to every person who is called, every person represented in oh, these God. prayer requests. We praise you, Lord. What a wonderful thing it is, Lord, when we think of the way you were conscious of human need. We think of that woman who made her way through the crowd, saying to herself, Oh, if I could only touch him, if I could only touch him, yes, Lord. and then touch the fringe of your garment. And you turned and said, Who touched me? Lord, the people who have called, and the many, many others who wanted to call, but didn't, now long to reach out for you. All of us, Lord, Jan and Paul and I and everyone here and everyone across this land, right at this moment, a part of this prayer, Jesus, are saying, Lord, if we could only touch you, and you turn and say, it's not your touching me, it's my touch of you. I know your need all power in heaven and earth is mine. Yes. I create it, and I'm here to recreate. Oh, blessed Lord, we thank you that right at this moment, as we surrender our needs to you, whatever they are, in our minds, in our emotions, our bodies, our relationships, the things that trouble us or frustrate us, those impossibilities that face us, whatever they are, Lord, we give them to you. We let go of them now. And suddenly, we feel your touch upon our shoulder. We feel your spirit pulsating through us. Amen. We feel your spirit touching the very tissues of our bodies that are ill. Those memories that need to be set free. Those broken relationships that need to be healed. Those unguided thoughts that harass us keep us from you. Lord, we give them all to you right Amen. now and yes. we say, oh, he touched me. Yes. He touched me. Thank you. We bless and praise you, Lord, yes. that long before we ever think about praying, you've created the desire in us to pray. And long before we even articulate our desires, you've made them real in us so that we know that you are more ready to answer than we even are to ask. Thank you. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. And now we relax in the wonderful flow of your spirit. We feel you anointing us right now. Filling our minds with your thoughts. Our emotions with your love. We feel the prison door of our wills open so that we can decide and do your will. Know that you are healing our bodies praise right now. Praise you, Lord. All praise and glory and honor be to you, Holy Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. 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 
And all the church said, Amen. All right. The moment that touch comes, let us know. We like to spread good news. You get the bad news on the 6 o'clock news <laughs> over on one of those other channels. We have the good news tonight. Glory. And uh, we like to spread it. We really do. Move to your phone. If you get the busy signal, dial again. We'll stand by these lines as long as they ring. The Hawaiians have blessed us tonight, and they're going to do it again. God gave the song is the name of it. It's a good one, too. Welcome them as they sing. Mark and Diane. So you ask me why my heart keeps singing. How I can sing Even when things go wrong But since I've found Sorts of music I just can't help it Cause God gave the song I found the source of all the music. You know, I just can't help it. Cause God gave my song. about singing everybody knows songs and everybody sings more or less and um, some of us have sing happy songs some of us sing sad songs we're talking we're singing now about a song that isn't limited to our styles or or the kinds of melodies and harmonies we may hear on the radio because really in our hearts even though we may sing songs on the outside and listen to music on the radio so many of us like we've been hearing and talking about tonight are going through so much discord and the melodies have gotten stale the melodies in our hearts the melodies of our lives and the things that started out so harmonious have just taken on such a jangle but God's promised a song to everyone who will follow him a song of life that starts now when we believe in him and will go on forever no matter what to everyone who believes in him no matter forever so come on and it's on Jesus day after day. Oh, that sun goes on. For once you know the source of music, He'll always hear it. God gave. Hallelujah. 
God gave the song. And it's that song that we are sharing with you tonight. That one that we just sang was a beautiful gospel song written by our good friend Bill Gaither several years ago. And we'd like to share with you now an old hymn that we have taken to heart so many years ago. It's called Our Great Savior, and it's sung in a lot of churches. And Maybe you sang this when or heard your mom singing this growing up in Sunday school somewhere. The words go, saving, helping, keeping, loving. He'll be with me till the end. Diane, what can we say? That well, Doctor Ogilvy said it best. He's, he leaned over. He says, "Paul, well, that That's is anointed. anointed. <laughs> that is anointed." And I'll take the anointing over talent any time. But when you have both, it's dynamite. I mean, it is dynamite. <laughs> Hawaiians, we love you. <laughs> and maybe tonight, for Doctor Ogilvy, if you could sing my favorite song, 
Down from his glory, oh, ever living oh. story. Have you ever heard them sing? I'd love oh, to hear them beautiful. sing. Uh, I think they can arrange that. And then, of course, Alex Shoney Brown is going to do a special little thing for mothers. Yeah. Yes, especially for the Israeli mothers out there. And that's going to be very special. Dr. Ogilvy, we, uh, we've kind of gotten into a, a subject here, which I maybe the Holy Spirit really, it, it's a little off of our... <laughs> <laughs> what we thought we were going to get into tonight at least. We're talking about the beautiful fullness or manifestation. Or There are so many different theological terms, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, overflowed with the Holy Spirit. I've heard many. Maybe you've got a new one or two that I haven't heard. What do you think has, has kept so many of the, of the great churches and denominations from just really moving on out into the great flow and manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Are, are there any keys there that we could... Well, Paul, I, I really feel that the Spirit gives himself in his fullness when we dare to do the impossible. He is the Lord of the impossible. Yes. And therefore, we need to face and confront the, the great needs within ourselves, which we can't solve, the problem people that we uh, deal with, the uh, complex circumstances that frustrate us, uh, the sickness of our society which besets us. If we bring those to him and dare to run on what I call a two-legged gospel, which is deep commitment to him and awareness and commitment to be his servants in the world, you know, fully mm -hmm. developed whole gospel, a biblical uh, faith, then he releases his power. Now, the church is often settled for one or the other. It's settled for uh, pietism, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus for me and my needs and uh, not caring for the world. Or likewise, we become so headlong involved in the world that we've forgotten to uh, find and keep open the channels for our strength. But once you are committed to a wholeness of uh, Jesus Christ, His uh, love and His power, and then multiplying your faith in the lives of other people, witnessing to what you believe, and then caring for the, the poor, the suffering, the needy, uh, those who don't know Christ, suddenly you're up against it. You don't have the strength that you need, and then He unleashes His power. And I believe that we are on the threshold of the most exciting period of Christian history. Amen. Because we are at a place where we're beginning to recognize the emptiness and the lack within us and the triumphant adequacy of Christ and what he's able to do mm. if we'll but trust him. Mm. Mm. I see it happening all over the world today. I guess the question then, Dr. Ogilvie, was, would be, Okay, how, how do we move into that place of power? Whatever theological term you want to put on it, how do we get there? How do we get that triumphant, vibrant, overcoming power in our lives that the gospel says we ought to have? Yes. Well, that vibrancy and power is Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is Christ present with us in the fullness of his power. G. Campbell Morgan had a marvelous statement in uh, his understanding of the uh, ministry of the living Christ. He said, very often we say, wouldn't it have been wonderful to be one of those disciples and walk with the Master and be able to touch him and feel uh, the warmth of the presence of God in him? And he said, not so. Thirty minutes after the descent of the Spirit, <laughs> The disciples knew more of Jesus than they had known through three years of walking and talking with him. True. So right now, at this moment in history, Jesus is more available to us mm -hmm. in the power of his spirit than he was to those with whom oh. he ministered. Oh, oh you know. my goodness. Uh, oh, that's power. So, and it's true. And if that is true, if that is true, 
what a wonderful thing uh, we can receive right at this moment. But what's the key? I go back to one word. It's a word that unleashed power in my own life. It's the word that gives me strength every day. It's the word uh, that has been used as the source of uh, insight and wisdom by some of the greatest scholars of history. Uh, it's the word, for example, that C.G. Jung identified as the secret of the Christian life. Mm. And that word is surrender. Surrender. <laughs> now, it's, it sounds like kind of a negative no. word, no. you know. In the battle of life, we want to win. Mm -hmm. And we forget the battle is the Lord's. So the secret is, first of all, surrendering our own lives, opening our minds and our hearts, uh, our emotions, our wills, our bodies to the Lord. But unless I miss my guess, in the two of you and in me and in everyone at this moment, there is some person, some situation, some problem, some uncertainty that now needs to be surrendered to him. Mm -hmm. And when that surrender is made, then his spirit flows in its majestic and unlimited power mm -hmm. into that situation. Mm -hmm. And he does what it is his will to be done in that situation. Mm -hmm. So in every moment, there's surrender that's necessary that unleashes his power. How did it happen in your life? Well, it happened... Uh, it, it, began in college. Uh, I had resisted the Christian faith as a boy. I had had too much religion and not enough life. <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, I turned off religious people because of the false kind of Christianity that they had communicated to me. Mm -hmm. Rules and regulations, and kind of a negative, hostile, uh, angry sort of Christianity. And so uh, from the time I was 13 until I was 18, I refused to go in the door of a church. I resisted uh, any form of Christianity. And then in my <coughs> first year of college, I met some authentic people who were alive in Christ, <laughs> whose experience of Christ had made them human, not religious. <laughs> and so they were free and, <laughs> and caring, and they communicated to me that God had a plan for my life. And I can still remember them asking me the question, have you ever turned as much as you know of yourself over to as much as you know of Christ? And they said, why don't you do it? And I went back to my uh, ah. room. It was four o'clock in the morning. We talked all night. And four o'clock in the morning, I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't know much about myself and I don't know much about you, but here's all I know about me. <laughs> And I want to know more about you. <laughs> and oh, in man. that moment, I sensed uh, the inflow of his power into my life. And what happened then was that I was given the gift of faith by which to entrust my life, to surrender my life mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. to his control. And that began the adventure. Yes. It was some years later, however, after I had been through college and uh, seminary and postgraduate school in Scotland under some of the finest teachers in the world that I was faced with the, my own impotence, my inability to live the Christian life mm -hmm. which I had studied and uh, tried to understand. <coughs> I was the pastor of a church in Winnetka, Illinois and I had uh, organized the church. 750 people had become Christians over the span of just a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And the church was growing, and yet something was missing. Someone was missing. <laughs> Someone was good, missing. Good. And the interesting thing <clears throat> was that I preached the plan of salvation. I was a biblical uh, scholar, preacher, and I uh, helped people to turn their lives over to Christ and start the Christian life. But people were not moving any further than I had lived in my own life, you see. Yeah. You can't lead anyone any further in Christ than you've dared to live yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a strange thing that happens. But the Lord brought me to the end of that because I realized two things. I didn't have any spiritual grandchildren. No one I had led to Christ had led anyone else to Christ. Uh -oh. 
Oh, okay. And the other thing was that I saw that the people whom I had led to Christ were living irrelevant lives to the great needs of society at that time. Mm -hmm. They weren't caring Christians in the sense that they were not uh, becoming involved in changing what was sick and uh, suffering in our society. Mm -hmm. And so I went away and I asked the Lord uh, mm -hmm. to show me what was wrong. And I studied uh, John 14, 15, and 16. Mm -hmm. And I came across that passage that said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, Lord. <laughs> uh, I, I've been trying, you know, and uh, studying and learning and getting a lot of big words to impress people and theories. And uh, <laughs> at, at that particular time, uh, I had all of the accoutrements of a Presbyterian garb, <laughs> backward collar, ro uh, uh, tabs, and, and robe upon robe upon robe. And <laughs> One of the things that had proven to me that I was more religious than I was living uh, was one day, prior to this uh, uh, confrontation of my own inadequacy, uh, I had put on all of my robes, and I was coming down behind the choir, and swaying back and forth in all my <laughs> Presbyterian dignity, you know? <laughs> and I just literally had cassocks and robes upon robes, you know, and must have hoods been and hot degrees. <laughs> and it must, yeah, it was warm. But my son, my oldest son, who was then a young boy, was enamored with Zorro. <laughs> Zorro, yes, yes, I remember and, him. <laughs> yes, you know, the black yes. uh, uh, clothed uh, yes. bandino. <laughs> and, and Scotty, had all of the clothing, the hat, the boots, <laughs> the, the black cape and everything. Well, we had left him home uh, when we went to church. <laughs> and he had come to church by himself later. And he was seated uh, on one of the pews right by the aisle. And as I came down the aisle, you know, suddenly he leaped out <laughs> into the aisle. And he waved his sword in front of me and said, Zorro! <laughs> <laughs> and I started to laugh. I could not stop laughing. This is in church now. Yes, in church. <laughs> and I laughed and laughed all the way up the rest of the aisle. I got to the pulpit and I was just shaking with laughter. <laughs> and suddenly I, uh, <laughs> I said, this is what I look like to my boy, mm. you know. A kind mm. of a makeshift uh, Zorro, Zorro. <laughs> in a clergy gown. <laughs> now, I still believe in robes, and I wear them in my program, as you know. And, sure. uh, but they're not, they're not important to me anymore. Sure. They're not my security. But anyhow, that helped me realize that I was taking myself too seriously and not taking God seriously enough. So I took the following summer, and I said, Lord, I really need to experience the reality of your spirit in me. Mm. And I realized that I had just half of the gospel. Mm. Now, all that training, all that graduate preparation, I had half the gospel. In other words, I knew what it meant to have uh, a faith in Christ, but I didn't know what it meant to have Christ live in me. Mm. You had the and letter. That's right. <coughs> of the law. And yeah. I realized that I had never come to the place of saying, Lord, live your life in me. Mm -hmm. And that was the secret that I needed to discover. And it happened to me that summer. Remember, I was on the uh, ocean side. I love the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I was all by myself. And the tide was out. And I wrote in the firmness of the sand mm -hmm. all of the frustrations and uh, the difficulties I was facing as a Christian leader. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm leading people into Christ but I saw no power in their lives. I had never seen anyone one to Christ whom I had led to Christ. You literally wrote this out yeah, in the sand. in the sand. You know, it, there was no one right in that part of the beach, so I was all by myself. Mm -hmm. And then I got down on my knees, <laughs> and I said, Lord, I see in the pages of the book of Acts what it means to be filled with your spirit. And I long for that. Mm -hmm. And... I ask Christ. now that you will come and make your post-resurrection home in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and I felt a power from the top of my head down to the bottom of my toes. And uh, every part of my being uh, was first warm and then vitalized. And uh, I returned home a different person. Mm. Not just a make-believe Zorro, <laughs> 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 uh, a new person. Oh and my. You see, if I would have died before that time, I'm sure I would spend eternity in heaven. You were saved, of course. But the Lord had something much more in mind. And I began to preach differently and loved people by the Lord's power and not just by my manipulative devices. Mm. And that began to expose to the congregation what life could be like in our time of history. Mm. And then, one day, one of my men who worked in Chicago, whom I'd led to Christ, talked to a man over lunch. And he said, have you ever turned your life over to Christ? Do you want now to accept him as your Lord and Savior and allow him to come and live in your life? And the man over lunch said, yes, I do, and made his commitment right there at lunch. And the man said, will you do me a favor? Uh, the man said, well, of course, you've just led me to eternity. <laughs> he said, I want you to get on the train, go out to Winnetka, and go to a little church that's on the corner there, rap on the pastor's study door, and tell him that you are his grandchild. Uh, <laughs> so number one. <laughs> the, man, the man got out of the train, came out to Winnetka, got off the train, took a cab out to the church, rapped on the door, came in, got nose to nose with me, and he said, hi, Grandpa. Oh, oh, that's my first, beautiful story. first grandchild in the faith. You know, it just overwhelmed me the other day. You know, I, I puzzled for many years as to why it seems that it's this area of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation, the gifts, the power, mm -hmm. where we've had so much difficulty in the church. You know, we basically, everybody in, that's in the real church believes in, in Christ. They believe he was born of the Virgin Mary. We believe he died on the cross. We believe he raised, was raised from the dead. We believe he's ascended to heaven. He's coming again. We, we just all fellowship around that, and there's hardly any problem in that area. But when you get down to the manifestations or the power of the Holy Spirit, it seems like there's where the church has had all of its controversy and division. And, and I, I, I said, Lord, why is that? And boy, it hit me all of a sudden. That's the power part of this. Mm -hmm. You know, Satan doesn't care as long as we'll stay inside our churches and sing our hymns and our songs. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I've, I've likened the church to a, a big, beautiful automobile. You know, Satan doesn't care if we polish the chrome and and sit in it and admire it and all that, but boy, you put gas in that machine and start going somewhere and all hell breaks loose. And boy, it just, it's like the blinders fell. That's why Satan has worked so hard to divide churches and denominations and brethren from, from the power of the Holy Spirit because that's what does him in. That's yes. what gets him. And what you mentioned earlier, I think, is also true, that we have become judgmental of one another about yes. particular gifts. Oh, yes. And we've said, uh, do you have this gift? Oh, you don't? Well, then you're not quite uh, mm -hmm. up to uh, my standards. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. caused uh, judgmentalism and walls that have grown between us as people. Rather than living the... Uh, manifestation of the power of God so fully mm. uh, that people say, how can I find what there you have found? There it is. And then, there it is. you see, there's receptivity, yeah. and people want to know, and we can explain uh, what it means to receive Christ living in us. I've just finished a very exciting study about uh, how the Spirit of Christ enters into us. Uh, I've done that with a few doctors who are uh, cardiovascular uh, and neurological experts. How? That's, well, that it's a fascinating. fascinating thing. They have helped me to understand that there are three parts to the nervous system, the thinking brain, and then what's called the limbic system that controls the uh, uh, pituitary and uh, the adrenal glands, 
and then the sympathetic adaptation system that controls the flow of uh, hormones into the blood and uh, gives us strength and energy uh, to respond to the challenges and opportunities of life. But only what goes through the cerebral cortex, the thinking brain, uh, gets into the rest of us, the rest of uh, mm -hmm. our life, our, our nervous system and our uh, emotions and into our body. It's the gateway to the That's soul, right. isn't it? So that uh, when mm -hmm. Paul said to the Philippians, have in you this mind which was in Christ Jesus, I believe that the tissues of our brain can be ingrafted, actually implanted with the actual thinking mind mm. of Christ mm. so that we can think his thoughts. And when that happens, then the signal sent to the rest of our nervous system uh, and uh, produce the kind of actions and reactions that are in keeping with the, his life in us. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. We'll have prayer again in just a little bit, but uh, this next song fits in beautifully with what we've been talking about. Thank God he looked beyond our faults mm. and he saw our need. Uh, Alex Shoney Brown is going to uh, minister on the violin. I think that's a, as good a word as you can use right now. And then he's going to break on into a little special something for all of you mothers. That'll be very, very enjoyable. Let's tell him thanks for just making us a very memorable evening tonight. Shoney Alex Brown <laughs> on the violin. Now, the next number I love to play, titled originally Yiddish Mama or the Jewish Mother, but this time I would love to dedicate in the name of Paul and Jan to the world of mothers, every mother out there and here in the, on the auditorium.
this one titled The Shepherds of Jerusalem in the street based on two old, old Romanian folk melodies, Shepherd of Israel. Tony Alex Brown. Uh, oh my. Dude. Dude. This, albums, this kind of music is available. Uh, Shoney, you've done how many albums? Eight albums? 
eight different albums. Many, many. Uh, they're available, I'm sure, in most of the classical sections of your uh, record album stores. I think we have a couple of them in the frame store. Uh, we could flash on the screen very quickly, perhaps. Uh, here's one called Love, Passion, and Fire. And, uh, oh my, so, so many, many here. A Touch of Love, there's one. Yeah. And just many, many, many. Uh, Jan and I have these forever, my love. In our home. In our home, <laughs> and we've been really enjoying them, and I know many of you will want to. Tonight has been a very special night. Joseph from Germantown, New York, just <laughs> accepted Christ. Robert from Cincinnati, Ohio. Betty from Beaver Creek, Ohio. Tricia from Richfield, New York. Browning from Pembroke Park, Florida. Mm. Gilbert from Southgate, California. Bill from Chino. Teresa from Los Angeles. Debbie from Covington, Kentucky. Eunice from North Hollywood. There's a prospect for you, Dr. Ogilvy, uh, pastor of North Hollywood's... Uh, Hollywood. Or Hollywood, not North. Hollywood's first Presbyterian... Where, where is the church located? It's right on the Hollywood freeway at the Gower Street exit. That's easy to find. That's why it's uh, uh, such fun to serve the whole Los Angeles basin because with the intertwining freeways, yes. uh, people can come right off at the Gower Street exit and come to church. I had an interesting experience, uh, Jen and Paul, you'd enjoy this. Uh, a man uh, from Idaho who uh, watches our program watched and noticed that at the end of the program, I shake hands with mm -hmm. people as they mm -hmm. come out of church and often give them a hug. Well, this man came out of church. He had a big cowboy hat on, cowboy boots, and, and his wife was half the size of this seemingly seven-foot man. <laughs> and he came tumbling down the stairs, and uh, he came up to me, and he got right like that, right at my nose, and he said, I've come from a hug. Oh, <laughs> and he said, Cute, We've been watching this program for two years, and we watch you hugging people, all kinds of people, young people, old people. We've come for a hug. Aww. And so I hugged him, <laughs> and I hugged him, <laughs> and he said, thanks very much, and away he went. <laughs> <laughs> people love that personal touch and that little bit of love yeah. that uh, is and so And I important. always watch until the end of your program. I, it, I love that. I yes. love it. It's very special. We really didn't get to the subject at hand. This gives us a good excuse to have you I come back that. real soon, Dr. Ogilvy. But this new book mm -hmm. that's just out entitled Falling Into Greatness mm -hmm. has a fascinating title. And I see it deals with the, the, the beautiful ministry of the Psalms which have meant so much to all of us. Some of the chapter titles are The Secret of Lasting Joy. That's enough right there to run out and buy it. <laughs> Living a Full Potential, The Apple of God's Eye, The Seven-Day Experiment in Truth. You trust. Don't, oh, trust, yes, trust. and truth. That's <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't need more than faith. When God seems absent, mm, triumph in trouble, that's a good one. Lord, get me out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, We've all said that. We could that. spend some time on that <laughs> chapter right now. Okay. How to receive power. Oh, my. Adventuresome living. Eternal security. Mm hmm. Mm. Pastor Jackson, are yes. you listening over there in Phoenix? <laughs> He'll no. go by this. <laughs> Have a great day. A case for gladness. Take a larger gift. Let God help you. God is there to meet you and falling into greatness. Wow. My goodness. Taken from the Psalms. I'm sure any time a book is born, there's got to be some experience, some uh, thing that motivated that. What, what, what brought this book to birth, Falling into Greatness? Well, the book itself uh, came into being in response to the needs of people. As you know, each year I survey the needs of my television audience and then respond in my preaching and I found that the challenges that people faced were perfectly matched by the character of God as revealed in the Psalms. I mm. read the Psalms most every day and I find in them the pulse beat of my own inner feelings. I've never had an emotion, never faced a problem, or never gone through a frustration that I haven't found 
it identified in the Psalms. Mm, good. Uh, where much of the scripture speaks to us about God's love. A wonderful way the Psalms speak for us. Mm. You know, <laughs> those times when you're, you're hurt so much you don't even know how to pray. We've all felt that. Mm -hmm. You open the Psalms and suddenly the psalmist begins to pray for you. Yes. True. And yeah. then you pick up his pace. Yes. And, and the Psalms are so honest. You know, they say, God, why? Uh, how? When? Where? And uh, we all felt that way. Yes. And when you're so frustrated, you don't know what to do, you open the Psalms and there's David saying, dear God. But the answer is always in the oh, yes. psalm, too. The interesting thing is that every psalm uh, presents a complex situation, but also God's firm and reliable answer. Good, good, good. So if you follow them through to the end, for example, the 22nd psalm, Jesus prayed uh, on the cross. It begins with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yes. But it ends in marvelous triumph. So often, all we've remembered is that Jesus prayed the first verse, and we forget that he went on to the triumph. He identified with our anguish of saying, why? But then he went on and, I believe, finished the prayer and uh, fulfilled uh, that victory on our behalf on the cross. Amen. The title of that book, Falling into Greatness, uh, came from an experience that was shared with me by a trapeze artist. He's now a <laughs> fine really? Christian leader. <laughs> But he told me that he learned how to fall by realizing that the net would always catch him. Ooh. And he found that when he knew that the net would catch him, he lost his fear of falling mm. sure. and he fell less. Uh -huh. So that uh, I believe that the arms of God are like uh, that net, that we fall and he catches us, picks us up, starts us over again and uh, gets us going Thank all God. over again. Mercy. I'm going to enjoy reading <laughs> Falling Into Greatness. You know, one of the rules of this program, Dr. Ogilvy, is <laughs> the samples get left here so that we... Unless you have to have... Thank you for sharing this night with us. Thank it's just enjoy. been so great, and please do come again real soon. You know, it's interesting. I, I got you. here, I was kind of tired of the full day. And just visiting with you has been so refreshing. Do you know what's going to lift Bless you even you. more? We're going out in song tonight. We really? have just enough time yes. to get this song Down in. From Down from his glory. Let's thank Dr. Ogilvy and welcome the Hawaiians one more time all together as we say good night.
Praise God. Mark and Diane, thank you. God bless you. Come on over and join us for a final little time of prayer as we say good night. What a joy to have been with you. What a wonderful night with Dr. Schuler, Dr. Ogilvy, the Hawaiians, and Alex Shawnee Brown. What a wonderful night. And we want to say again, happy, happy, happy Mother's Day to all you very special mothers, Amen. including Diane Yasa. Yes. <laughs> good night. God love you. We love you. And remember, let everything that hath breath just praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Good happy night. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, call our prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. If you'd like an audio cassette of Praise the Lord, please join us for program 510-84. That's 510-84. If possible, duck in a love gift to help defray the cost of the tape ministry. TVN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So right today, praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Paul and Jen would like to thank you for your prayers and financial support. You keep us off the air. Thank you. This is Jim McCullough saying, God bless you. And remember, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. This program was brought to you by the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout the United States of America.